Yeah, so Jan has just talked to you about how, you c how um, we make computers go faster by having more parallelism within a single node. And when that fails us, um, we start adding nodes. We start linking them together using an interconnect. And one of the libraries we use to do this is called MPI. So MPI is, uh, stands for the Message Passing Interface. So as you can guess from the name, it works by passing messages from one process to another. It was born in 1991. Uh, currently, it's version 3.1. And it's a single program multiple data model. So the same program, you write one program that runs on a whole bunch of nodes at the same time, which gives a distributed memory model. So each, each copy of the program has some fraction of the memory across the global, uh, the global computation. This then makes it so that if, you, if you're scaling out because a node doesn't have enough RAM, it reduces the RAM requirement on each node. The communication is explicit. You tell the program when you want to pass a message. And so the library provides you with things like point-to-point -point send and receive. So I want to send a message from node 1 to node 5, please. Uh, they have immediate versions. If you've ever wondered what MPI I send stands for, the I is for immediate. It returns immediately. Uh, so yeah, that's non-blocking communication. So in the default versions, you wait until the message arrives. In the non-blocking version, you, it, it sends. And then you don't care whether it's arrived. You carry on with your execution, which means your program runs faster. But you need to take more care as to where, uh, where you make sure that the communication is finished. It also has points to all broadcast operations. And then collective operations like reductions, where you do a sum across the, the set of processes. So that's MPI. Bring people up to speed who haven't worked with MPI before. So the problem you encounter with MPI codes is you write some communications, you're getting the right answer, but it runs slower in parallel than it did on one node, which is kind of the opposite of why we wanted to use MPI, right? We, we wanted it to go faster. We've added the communications. We've added more power. It's slower. Why? So one thing we can do to fi find this out is to use profiling tools. And that's the aim of this talk, is to show you that profiling tools are a good idea and why you might want to use them. So fortunately, Intel have sold us some profiling tools. These are installed on the Sunbird cluster. You will be able to use these. Uh, so to do this, you need to source this variable script to update your environment. and then. MPI run, if you haven't used MPI, MPI run is how you run an MPI application, surprisingly. And you just add this argument, dash trace, and it tells it to trace the MPI calls for you. The output to this can be very large, because it logs every single message that you send from every rank to every rank. So choose a small problem size. Uh, try and reduce it to something that runs in a minute or two, ideally less. If, if, if it takes a few minutes, then it starts to get out into the 30, 50 gigabyte size. And you don't really want that when you're trying to analyze the data after the fact. So choose a small problem size. And also choose a relatively small level of parallelism, small enough, big enough to demonstrate the scaling that you want to see, so it has more than one node, but small enough that, again, your output file doesn't balloon. And then Trace Analyzer is a nice GUI, GUI tool that will let you visualize the output of your trace. Uh, when you run it, this is what you get. So this is looking at some anonymous code that the RSC team took in to take a look at because it, it wasn't scaling as ideally as, as the user would hope. And we're trying to analyze why. You can immediately see in blue is the serial code. In blue is the computation. And in red is the time it spends doing communications. So you can see why this isn't scaling. It's spending all its time doing communications. So that kind of tells us what we knew already. But on the right-hand side, you can see that where which MPI calls are taking up the time. So you can see MPI broadcast and MPI barrier are the two functions that are taking the time here. So immediately, just from the summary screen, you can start looking at the code and work out where are my broadcasts, where, my, where are my barriers, does this make sense? But sometimes this isn't enough detail, so we can look in more detail. You can see this is the timeline of the whole application. So you can see the same information here, that it's spending most of its time in MPI. You can see over here that there are some problems that the uh, trace tool knows about. It knows 
it knows things like if you arrive late at a barrier, then uh, every, all other processes are going to be waiting on the late process. You can see that's only about 1.5% of execution time, which is not the 80% that we're waiting on. So we've got to look at this more closely. So you can see at the top here, in a normal application, you'd expect this to be mostly blue, but this is mostly red. So you can see that the communication is spread across the entire application. It's not concentrated in one section. So when you zoom in and enable the event timeline, you can see this, you can see this is zoomed into this really narrow region here. And you can see this is really, really tight. So here we see that this is what 477.4, 477.7. So this is uh, 300 microseconds of time on, on, the, on the T axis, the, the horizontal axis here. And you can see it's got a very tiny amount of communication and then an MPI barrier and then another tiny amount of computation, then a uh, broadcast, and so on. So you can see these broadcasts and barriers, these global operations that are quite time consuming, are scattered really, really tightly in really tight loops. So, you, and this happens, you, you can scroll across and see this happens throughout the execution of the program. So you know when you zoom in, uh, you, want, you want to look at where in the code this is coming from, where you've got this tight loop with MPI broadcast, MPI barrier, and try and work out how you can reduce the frequency of these calls to MPI broadcast and barrier, whether you can do just peer-to-peer -peer communications instead, or whether you can do non-blocking, whether you can do more iterations before you need the broadcast and barrier, or whether you can restructure your algorithm. There are some other tools you can see. So this is the message pattern. So you can see, you, if you look at this carefully, you can see that this is a coordinator worker model. You can see that process zero is the, is the coordinator because no processes are sending messages to it, and it's sending messages to everyone else. And the other processes are the workers that have some peer-to-peer -peer communication. And you can see there's some kind of load imbalance here because it's taking 6.3 seconds talking to five, six, and seven, and then no seconds talking to one and four. So there's possibly some, some imbalance there that you could try and look into whether you can balance the work more effectively between your processes. Also, you can look at time spent in reductions. So you can see it's roughly even. It's about 135 uh, in each broadcast, 130 plus or minus a bit. So that's the load balancing isn't as much as of a concern here, but the fact that this number is so large, as we discussed on the previous slides, is the main concern. It's, and again, it's barrier and broadcast that are being the problems. So the ways forward. So we found, we found MPI barrier and broadcast are taking up a lot of time, that communications were scattered in tight loops throughout the program, with very small amounts of compute between each communication. We found it had this coordinator worker pattern that had not, uh, not ideal load balancing, perhaps. Uh, and in general, the communicator worker pattern, sorry, the coordinator worker pattern can be not as great as having a peer-to-peer -peer pattern, simply because then the coordinator is doing a lot of communications and isn't, it might not have time to do its work. So things to think about, can we use a peer-to-peer -peer pattern? Can we increase the amount of work between each communication? And is the direction we're parallelizing inappropriate? So most problems we work on are multidimensional. And if you parallelize in the wrong di direction, then you're going to have a lot of communications. Maybe there's another dimension you can parallelize in that will, will require less communication. And in, the, in this code, this is the approach we ended up taking. If that fails, you can consider more advanced MPI features, a couple of which I'll introduce quickly. So one is MPIIO. So MPIIO is if you're spending a lot of time doing input output to disk, to and from disk, this is the way you can speed that up. So what you might be doing, you might be just transferring all of your data to one node, then writing it with the standard file interface and vice versa to read. Uh, MPI has routines that can do this in parallel a lot more quickly. It's higher performance. It works really well if you're, if you're um, it works well with these MPI subarray types. So if you're a Fortran programmer, this is what it looks like in, in Fortran. 
Uh, so you've got, you open a file, you set a view on a file, you read a file, you close the file. It's four, it's four lines plus the, the two lines it takes to define the subarray type. So it's at least on regular structured grids, it's really nice and simple to do, and I'd strongly recommend you look into it. So that's the initialization of the subarray type. All of that is boilerplate. That's just defining a lattice, or uh, that's defining your volume. This, these are the two MPI calls, and it looks bulky on the screen, but it's, it's dead simple. It's six MPI calls. It will change your life as far as I.O. is concerned. Another thing to try is persistent MPI communication. So um, every time you have a send-receive in your program, it creates an overhead as it negotiates that connection. So if you're in a really tight loop, this wastes a lot of time. So what you can try instead is outside the loop, define a persistent communication with send in it and receive in it. And then inside the loop, you just do an MPI start or an MPI start all to start the communication. And that, uh, you then also need a wait or wait all because this is um, immediate, this is non-blocking. But this will give you a speed up depending on what architecture and what communications fabric you're using. So on some systems we've seen with tight loops, you can get a 20% performance improvement just by changing about three lines of code to define your communication outside a loop instead of inside it. Uh, this is planned to be extended to collector operations like reduce and all reduce in MPI 3.2, but that's not available yet, sadly. So, yeah, that's all I've got. Thanks for listening. Okay, thanks, Ed. Uh, we now have time for one question. Yes. Yeah, right. uh, I think this question was the internet paper file. Mm. Right. Have you tried all the first version of the Tau The Have I tried which one? The Tau is one PAU on our file. I, I have never had a license from Paraview, so I've not tried Paraview. Um, Tau I'd not heard of. Okay, we will not comment. I was just curious to see if you have I presented Intel because it's the one I've got experience with. Okay. Um, I have tried to get the, is it Paraver, the Barcelona one working? Yeah, Paraver, yeah. Yeah, I've, 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 I've tried that, but I've never, I, I, I haven't yet got around to actually visualizing results on it. So okay. I, th I find the Intel one is the easiest to get set up, as it were, because okay. you, you can just run with dash trace on your MPI run. Okay, let's thank you once again.